U.S. Motorsports Hall of Famer Chip Hanauer joining us. No one has won more American Powerboat Association Gold Cups. 11 titles for Hanauer. He is a household name in the Northwest. And Chip, thank you for coming in. Um, I'm really looking forward. It's a big week with Seafair, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing some stories. But how excited are you when it gets to late summer and, and you get involved again with the hydroplanes? Well, you know, I, I'm a Seattle native. Um, I'm a fourth generation Seattleite. So as a kid growing up here in the 50s and 60s, there was kind of two big weeks of the year, Christmas and Seafair. <laughs> and for me, Seafair trumped Christmas by a lot. So it's just been part of my culture and part of growing up here. I know you're from Michigan, and the Gold Cup was huge in Detroit. You were just outside in Bloomfield Hills. Yeah. And, and Seattle was a different place there. There was no, Son well, there's still no Sonics. <laughs> there there was no Mariners. There was no Seahawks. Um, it was kind of what we had for a professional sport. When you, before we dive into some things, um, are you a little, like, do you see the sport kind of, um, uh, that people have lost interest in the Northwest and maybe it's an older crowd and you're trying to get the younger crowd interested in it? Do you ever see it? Well, I think it's really complex. I think we could sit here for hours and talk about what happened or what has happened. And I think the culture has changed. I think motorsports in general is, is struggling. I mean, I think probably when you were 16 and I turned 16, we couldn't wait to get our driver's license. Right. You know, cars and fast stuff was cool. Well, now I have friends with 16-year-olds and they don't want to get their driver's <laughs> Isn't license. Isn't that stunning? It's stunning. I just can't believe it. And, you know, the phones have come in. And um, on the other hand, the sport did a very poor job, I think, adapting. Uh, and I think I've been screaming for decades, we need to change, we need to change, we need to change. And I think they've been too late doing that. I, mean, I think they need to do it soon or we're going to be even bigger trouble. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about you, you know, because there's a lot of stories out there. And, of course, the books about you and a lot of, um, you know, just written pieces about you. But how did you develop this love affair for racing way back when? You know, Paul, it's it's funny. I'm the only person I know that at the age of five, I knew what I wanted to do. There was just no question in my mind. I wanted to be a race driver. And at that time, it didn't matter what it was. I just wanted to race <laughs> something. And growing up in Seattle, obviously boats were everywhere. And the Seattle Outboard Association had a class for kids from nine to 12. And that was it. I just had to do it. And so, I mean, there's not a day that goes by that I don't pinch myself and think, how did a kid growing up in Seattle who dreamed of being a hydroplane driver and have it actually work out? Uh, the odds were very slim, and I'm very grateful. Wow. I mean, your career is, is unbelievable, but you did start when you were nine. Is that when you and your dad kind of yeah. went on a, a, a bit of a circuit? Like, tell me a little yeah. bit about that. Well, we used to camp as a family. We had a little 16-foot ski boat, and we traveled around the state going to different places, tent camping and water skiing. And we went to Crescent Bar. And Crescent Bar back then does not resemble what it looks like now. It was just a spit of land. And Seattle Outboard Association was having an outboard racer, and I was probably seven at that time. And I saw that, and I saw they had a class for kids, and that was it. I had to do it. And I went to my father and said, you know, I really want to do this. I want to do this. Like all fathers, he said, when you can afford to do it, oh. you can do it. So I painted fences and delivered papers and babysat and dog walked and bought my first boat for 250 bucks, and I was off and running. And then my dad was very supportive, and we traveled all over the country racing. But what a great lesson, though, for the, for the young kids out there. Like, you know, because nowadays there's this feeling that the young people want uh, things handed to them. But here you are, and, and me, I had paper routes and all yeah. those things. I don't even think these kids know what a paper route is nowadays. Well, you know, it's funny you say that, Paul, because I was just talking the other day with a friend. Um, I don't see kids mowing lawns anymore. It's all professionals with, you know, trucks. Great point. I, I don't see kids. I, I grew up in Newport Hills in Bellevue, and I went to the barber shop in the New York or the Newport Hills shopping center and asked if I could shine shoes in the barber shop. I did that. Um, you just don't see kids out doing that anymore. Yeah. So.
The world's changed. Right. Well, of course. You know, we're not we're not two old men in here bashing. It's just it's just an right. interesting observation yeah. that, you know, because I remember my childhood too. I mean, gosh, I would cut lawns. It was because to me it was easy. You're just outside in the sunshine yeah. cutting cutting a lawn. And and everybody did it. Mm-hmm, I right. mean, every every kid was doing something to get some money together to buy a skateboard or buy snow right. skis or do something. And and like you said, I'm not bashing it it's just different yeah and it's like the city the city is not the city i grew up in i'm not saying it's worse but it's not the same city do you still do a lot of public speaking i don't do as much as i used to do simply because um you know i'm how old am I? i'm 65 and you know so my target audience is kind of mostly retired now i think um, i do a little bit but yeah. not like i used to but when you did uh it was it was interesting because I think you entitled it "Lessons from a Dangerous Life." Um, you probably learned a lot of lessons in your career, <laughs> but but was there is there one or two that stuck out that you just re, you know that one like a point you like to make when you talk in public? Um, yeah, I went through a lot of different things, um, but I think that's a good question. Was ever asked me that? Um, I think it's it's to be present and to be present with people because when I think back about racing it's never about being in a boat it's never crossing the finish line it's never it's about the time i spent with the people and i'm really grateful that i was aware enough at the time to really invest in the people and enjoy being with them so i think whatever you're doing it's really important that you enjoy the people and i i would say if you're doing a job that you really love, but you don't like the people, go find somewhere where you enjoy the people. Because today, if friends said, hey, we're going to go dig a latrine, I'll go dig a latrine if it's with the right people. But I don't want to do any job if it's not with people that I don't enjoy. Yeah, that's a, that's a great lesson for everyone. Um, because, like, you know, I think, I think it was Dave Niehaus who said he just he, – he never worked a day – he felt like he never worked a day in his life because he just yeah. enjoyed everything he did, you know, when it came to baseball. Yeah, I, I feel that way too, and, and you probably do. You know, I mean, you're – like myself, we grew up doing something we love, and, you know, I'd say multiple times a day I pinch myself and say, you know, this is crazy. I'm so fortunate and I'm so grateful that it all worked out for me. And uh, I'm just just very shocked, actually, and yeah. grateful. Well, I mean, your name is, is synonymous with uh, with hydroplane racing, and especially in the Northwest, people just when they hear Chip Hanna, they're like, "Oh, boat guy," you know. And, and I know that uh, that's that's probably how you've been referenced. <laughs> I well, think there's a book out there called The Boat Guy. Right. Well, they probably wonder is that guy still alive? <laughs> <man>? <laughs> well, you know, you you talk about the. Um, I, I kind of want you to tell me a little bit about the cockpit. When you're in that cockpit and you're driving that, that hydroplane, especially back in the day in the heat of competition, what's it like? How can you describe that to somebody? I couldn't tell you because I'm numb. And I think when you're operating at that level you need to operate on to really, really exceed and be exceptional, you're unconscious. You, you're not thinking. And I was absolutely numb. Um, I remember I think about the Forrest Gump movie. Remember when he catches the touchdown and he runs through the end zone, then he runs out of the stadium, then he runs across the parking lot. Well, it was that way for me. I'd go across the finish line. The guys on the radio are going, okay, stop, 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 (laughs) because you're just in this place. And there's a great book called Outliers, and it's about how to get in that zone. And I remember I was very lucky when I was with Miller. I got to have dinner with Reggie Jackson one time. And we were talking about this very subject. And he talked about hitting three home runs in a World Series, right? Isn't that what he did? It was yeah. three home runs. Mm-hmm. And I said, you know, how, how does that happen? He goes, same thing as I just said. He goes, I don't know. He said, that day, it looked like a beach ball. He said it would leave the pitcher's hand. And it was this big, slow beach ball. And I could just stand back and look around. And go, I think I'm going to put it over there said it was never like that before it was never like that after but every once in a while i think whether you're a musician or a dancer or you know a football player if you can get into that zone it just happens yeah and it it doesn't happen all the time it doesn't happen all the time and it happens to different degrees Mm -hmm. and now i'm studying music 
and I mean, I started racing when I was very young, so it just gets into your central nervous system. I started music really old, so I very seldom can get into that place. It happens every once in a while, but not with the frequency it did at something that I started at so young. Yeah. Um, and I really encourage people to, well, kids and parents, if if a kid shows any interest in anything, not just sports, but anything, just pour it to it. You know, no pressure, but just stoke that fire because those little nerve endings are just absorbing stuff really quickly. Yeah. I, I had that own experience with my own son. Like he was huge into drums and huge into music. So we, we kept, you know, pushing, you know, trying to buy the equipment he needed and just so he could just so yeah. he could keep growing in, yeah. in that area because you're right. Like if if your son or daughter loves something so much that if you if they can make a career out of that, wow. Yeah. You know, then you got it. But but if not, it's still worth it. Right. You know, and a lot of I get a lot of people come to me that have kids that show talent in racing and they go, We you know, at ten or eleven, we want you know, we want them to go to NASCAR, we want them to go to Formula One. It's like don't do that. <laughs> just just race. Just just enjoy. Yeah. And I think the flip side of that about young people is is older people like myself. I mean, I started playing flamenco guitar at 55, which is really stupid. <laughs> but I love it. I just can't get enough of it. And I think what happens with a lot of us at a certain age, we think we're too old to start something new. Will I ever become a world-class flamenco guitarist? No, but it provides me a ton of pleasure. So I encourage older people to, you know, I, I call it the, uh, the the nursing home test. I thought, and that's what actually got me playing flamenco, is I was sitting going, you know, the worst case scenario in life for me would be being in the nursing home, staring at a ceiling, going, why didn't I try whatever, whether it fail or not? So I tell people, I go, if there's anything that you're going to regret not having at least tried it or experienced, go do it. Yeah. And, and the other thing good about doing something, I think, older, you know, sports or otherwise, is you don't need to be world class. You can just enjoy. When you're a kid, you're so competitive. Well, we were talking about that before we got on the air here. You were playing uh, yeah, soccer, yeah. and people at our age were taking it a little too serious. Yeah, I just and, thought it. And I, I've seen that league. happen, too, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, that's kind of funny. It's just like you're just kind of like, well, I just want to go knock it around and try to stay in shape. And then all of a right. sudden you realize you're getting tripped and pushed and you're like, um, <laughs> I'm in the wrong league. Right. Uh, but people but, still trying to get their letter. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I love that, man. That's a good one. <laughs> all right. So um, let's, let's get back to a little bit of the racing. Although I was going to ask you, is that the only instrument that you play? That is the only instrument. Okay, that, and it's just an interest. You're like, I mean, if you threw a dart at the wall at instruments, no. like, no, I love it. I didn't even know what flamenco was, but I'd heard it. The first time I heard it was at the 1962 Seattle World's Fair. Huh. And every once in a while in other pieces of music, I would hear that Spanish sound. And I'm like, I really like that. I didn't even know what the name was when I started. Yeah. And and now I'm I'm as consumed with it as I was with racing, although I'm not making any money and I'll never be great at it. But I still derive as much passion from it. Yeah. That's interesting. So there's a lot of people, I'm sure, listening that have never heard of that instrument. And, and uh, now, just hearing you say that, people can uh, they can understand, they can almost hear how that sounds. Yeah, that, flum that Spanish mm -hmm. guitar sound. Yeah. Um, you know, when you started racing, you, you know, every everybody gets their break. You know, you try to get in one boat, then, you you know, you, you, you bump up and you bump up. And you had your big start with, you know, with atlas van lines i mean that was kind of like that did you feel like at that time that you were on the map was that was that the time yeah probably there's a lot of those times mm -hmm. but yeah that was a big one for me um bill muncie was you know he was you know the babe ruth of hydroplane racing and when he was killed um they built the team decided they wanted to keep going they built a new boat and I remember one evening the boat was almost done they were painting the boat and I pulled up to the shop and the sign painter was painting my name on the side of the Alice van lines and it took my breath away mm. I'm like that's crazy that my name is where Bill Muncy's name should be and I used to 
make the analogy of maybe what it would have been like for a kid growing up, you know, wanting to be a baseball player and, and seeing his Yankee uniform, you know, or Mariner uniform hanging in a locker for the first time. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, wow, I'm really here. And you were handpicked by Bill Muncy, right? Well, before, I mean, before, un unbeknownst to the tragedy, of course. Unbeknownst to me, um, <laughs> apparently he had talked to Fran Muncy, his wife, about that if something ever happened, he wanted the team to go on and that maybe they should take a look at me. So, um, yeah, and then we went on that year, which was 82, and just had this magical year. It was just crazy magical. Uh, we won the Gold Cup in Detroit. Nobody thought we could win against the Budweiser because they had this bigger Griffin engine. Uh, Bill couldn't beat it. And it just all worked out. And I could have been hit by a train that fall and gone, okay, I've experienced everything wow. I want to experience. Well, I, I want to talk about Miss Bud in a sec, but, but the before you jumped in Atlas Van Lines, you had a what the Squire Shop race team, right? And you replaced Jerry Bangs, who also died in a wreck. So, yeah. it's, so I have to ask you. I know what, where you're going. Well, I, yeah. okay, yeah. I mean, and you probably no, asked and, this and before, valid. but if it's, I'm if I'm a driver and I'm like, yes. okay, I'm getting into this field. Yep. This guy, uh, you know, unfortunately died. Yep. This terrific, legendary racer died. Yep. And here I am getting in the cockpit of yep. of what is a very dangerous sport. Yep. Um, you know, how did you gauge, you know, going in? Um, I was young and dumb, you know, um, the sport was lethal. So all of us involved in the sport at that time just accepted it's lethal. So you've kind of already made that assumption. Uh, but now as a 65 year old man, looking back at that going, what was I thinking? I, I replaced a number of dead people and a number of um, you know, broken necks, mm. people that were paralyzed. And in this state of mind, I get somebody said, Hey, you know, this guy just got killed doing this. You want to jump in there and, and do it? No, but it just was part of the sport and accepting. And, and everything looks different to me today. Yeah. You know? Boy, but I mean, when you put it like that, it's like, it does like the rest of us are going. There's no way. No. Or most of us are saying, especially right. me. Uh, I don't think I want any part of that. No. And it may be if I did it once, but it was a number of times. Yeah. But um, I ran into an old friend, Eddie Lawson. He was a great uh, U.S. Uh, MotoGP champion, and I ran into him. And these are road race motorcycles. So guys are dragging their knees, and he said, "Do you miss it?" And I said, "No, I don't. Do you miss it?" He goes, no. He goes, I got up the other day and I turned on the Spanish Grand Prix and I'm drinking coffee and I'm looking at it going, what the hell was I thinking? <laughs> and it's the same for me now. And also, Paul, let's remember the sport was different then. Um, if you crashed, you died. Nowadays, it's like NASCAR. with the, And I'm proud to say I was part of that. I was the first guy to wear belts. They tried to stop me and then we got the canopy. So the sport was much different than it is today. If you see a boat flip today, you it's like seeing a crash in NASCAR. Your first assumption is, oh, he's fine. Mm -hmm. Now, things can go wrong, but your first assumption is he's fine. But back then, if a boat flipped, you assumed he was probably gone. Man. Well, take me back to, I got here in 93 in the Seattle area, and I was on the shores when, uh, when you had that crash in 94 um, in qualifying on a Friday. Uh, there were there to stand Sarah's pits on Lake Washington and take me through what was going through your mind if you because it was so fast and so quick I'm sure but we will never know how that feels what was it like for you when you took flight well the taking flight I had experienced before it's like I said earlier it's part of the deal and your first reaction is damn this is going to ruin a perfectly good day <laughs> and probably a perfectly good pair of underwear. But, um, what was exceptional about that crash is when the boat goes airborne, you're hoping land right set up, land right set up. It didn't. It landed upside down. And then there's two ways of getting out. There's an escape hatch to the bottom, which is now above you, and there's the canopy that's under you. Well, the bow was so damaged, I couldn't get either door open. The cockpit fills up with water. We have an air mass, but I couldn't get enough air 
to feel quenched. I could just keep getting enough air to stay conscious. And that was horrible. It was really horrible. And it was about almost 10 minutes before they got me out of there. Mm. So that one, that one I remember. And um, again, back to being young, in an hour and a half, I was just in the backup boat. You know, now I would have to go away for a month and, you know, go sit on a mountaintop and recoup. Yeah, but, you mean, know, it's you just become, you know, I came up with a little saying back then and in like all sports, um, you have to be a warrior. And I came up with a little saying that I think being a warrior is really good for the ego, but it's hard on the soul. And uh, as you get older, you're more interested in your your soul and your comfort. So. Again, I look back at that and I think, what was I thinking? Yeah. Was that your worst one? That was my most uncomfortable one because I was conscious for the whole thing. I thought I was going to drown. Yeah. I've had other accidents where I've broken my back. Actually, that wasn't an accident. That was the escape hatch under the boat actually failed. Oh, and I got hit here in the rear end. It took my, I belted in, it took my legs and put them over my feet. Mm -hmm. And I broke my first, second, and third transverse um, processes in my back. Um, the one that I think did the most damage to me was a, a Budweiser crash where I was knocked unconscious. And I was out for about 15 minutes. And I now suffer a neurological disease that makes it difficult to speak. The only way I can speak to you today is they inject me in my vocal cord muscles with Botox, the same stuff, you know, people use yeah. for cosmetic. Um, otherwise, it's almost impossible for me to speak. And that was that was the result of of the crash you're speaking of or with a 94 crash? That was the crash I'm speaking of where I was knocked unconscious for so long. So I think it was a pretty bad head injury. Because you lost your voice for three years is what I read. Well, I've still lost it. The only, the only way I can keep speaking is um, the fine people at uh, at the Kaiser Permanente inject me in my vocal cord muscles about every six weeks. And without it, I can... I can be understood, but it's it's hard. It's exhausting. So I'm like, you know, I got I saw that news today about that fighter who died. Mm -hmm. um, so head injury in all sport is it's a real thing, and I think we we have to think about that. Well, I want to ask you one question about about Bernie Little and, and Miss Bud because there was a time where you know if they if people don't realize. I don't think maybe they do, but Bernie was for, you know he was. Miss Bud was just crushing everybody, but it was decades. I mean, they started yeah. this thing in the 60s yeah. where he would just, you know, he had a lot of support, a lot of boats. You were in that boat for, I think, four or five years? Not three years. Three years. Yeah. 92 to 95, I think, yeah. was it. Was. Yep. So when you're in that um, in that situation and, and you, you everybody going to these races feels like, Miss Bud's going to win. Why mm -hmm. are we here? So... And, and and as the, the sports analysts, you know, as we're sitting there on the beach going, you know... It's Miss Bud's race. How much of an advantage was it to have to have those resources, and 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 how much is it on the driver, and how much is it a beautiful boat? Well, it's everything. You know, it's a really good question. You know, let's talk about the resources first. You know, the Yankees win a lot of World Series, not because they're lucky, but they got a lot of resources. You buy talent, and it was the same thing in motorsports. You buy talent. You people look at, and the question is, is it the driver of the machine? It's not that so much because the machine is a creation of people. So the resources buy you great people, great people get you great machines. Now, is it the driver or the crew chief or the, the team? And the analogy is that to a basketball team. So you have guards and forwards. And there are some nights where the forwards are just unstoppable. And all the guards got to do is just keep feeding it in there. You know, they go for a ride. Next night, the forwards can't hit anything, and the guards have to pick it up from the outside. So it's the same thing in racing. And that's what we're going to talk a lot about in two weeks when we do Seafair here. Um, because there's some drivers that have a better boat. So their job is to not screw it up. They have a lot to lose. But there's a couple of other guys that have a little bit less boat, but they're hugely talented. So they can swing for the fence. And, you know, Budweiser did have an advantage, but I'm proud to say that um, I took seven gold cups in a row at their expense. So, and I treasured that. 
I treasured, and I was going to ask you that because you're a field goal kicker. So as a race driver, on one hand, I wanted to have the best boat because I wanted to win. On the other hand, I like not having the best boat because I had nothing to lose. Yeah. I could go in there and swing for the fence. So as a field goal clicker, do you want that call with, with one second left on the clock to save the game, or do you dread that? Well, I think, I think most of us are nervous as ever when, when it gets to that point. <laughs> but then you look at the history of these kickers, and people say, oh, kickers are a dime a dozen. Yeah, but the guys – that have the stones that are yeah. really good at it. Yeah. Um, they're not, and that's why I can't, even the Seahawks have gone through just a rash of them of late, and even the NFL. That's a revolving door. Yeah, um, but I will say that that, and to your point, um, a driver that can take it to the next level. Like I remember kicking or watching Josh Brown kick a 55 yarder in just very cold last minute uh, game in Denver. He won the game on this kick. In the final seconds, yeah. who has who can go out there when it's 15 degrees and yeah. kick it off the ground when it's dirt and knock it through in the clutch like that? That's that, just a just a different gene, a and, different level. And that's where the satisfaction is. Mm -hmm. You know, he went home that night. To this day, he's thinking about that. 30 seconds before, he's like, I don't want to be in this situation. But you live for that. As a competitor, as a warrior, you're scared of it, but you live for it. Yeah. And when it works out and you win a race with less equipment or you kick a field goal at the last second in conditions that you just described, that's what you treasure. That's what you remember. Yeah. Well, clearly, you have those credentials, Chip. I mean, you watching you go is just like, man, you had a heck of a career. And I know at, at 65, you're still – you're still driving around out there, aren't you? You still jumping a boat here and there? Yeah, in fact, uh, you and I are going to be doing Seafair uh, live television, but I'm going to I'm going to have to leave you a couple of times because we're going to run my old Atlas Van Lines, the boat that I won my first Gold Cup in. So yeah, I still go out there and don't go fast enough to hurt me or anybody else. And uh, what is what fun. is that speed? What um, about 140 <laughs> at max. <laughs> But but that boat was capable back in the day of like 170. And in driving a boat or a race car or anything, it's like walking up to the side of a cliff. You know, you if I said, would you walk within 10 feet of the edge of the Grand Canyon? You'd probably go, yeah, I'll do that. You know, what could happen? You know, and I said, well, will you stand within an inch of the Grand Canyon? Well, I'll have to think about that. Will you dangle your toes over it? So. When I'm driving the Atlas, I'm 10 feet back from the edge of the Grand Canyon. Uh, final heat in the old days when I was racing, I was backwards with my heels over the Grand Canyon. <laughs> and uh, those days are gone for me. I'll leave that to the, the guys that are out there now. Yeah. And we have some amazingly talent. There is more talent right now driving at one time than I've ever seen. These guys are amazingly good. That is high praise for someone like you. I'm glad I don't have to race them. Um, Andrew Tate, uh, Jimmy Shane, J. Michael. J. Michael Kelly might be one of the, the greatest driver ever. I mean, there's there's some real talent. And there's going to be a real story because Jimmy Shane has got the best equipment in the Home Street Bank. But uh, Andrew Tate and J. Michael Kelly have nothing to lose. They're hugely talented and hugely motivated. And Seattle, for some reason, every time I think, you know, you talk about the Budweiser domination, there's been a number of years where it looked like one boat completely had it sewed up going in. They didn't win. So magic always happens out on Lake Washington. Yeah, you're right. Anything can happen on race yeah. day. Yeah. And uh, and looking forward to the final for sure when, when you get all those guys together. So, well, it was always fun watching you race, Chip. It well, really was. You. It's been great catching up with you. And, and thank you for the stories and, and, and all of the experiences that you had in your career. Thank you.